there was this new artist named Tim McGraw. And he said he wanted me to work on the new album. That album was not only a number one album, but he had five number one singles on that album. And for 13 years, I did every album that was on Curb Records. Hey friends, welcome to another episode of Stories from the Valley. In this series, we chat with ordinary people that have chased their passions in life and turned them into their career. Today I chat with my good friend Glenn Schweitzer. Glenn is a graphic designer, photographer, and documentary filmmaker. He's worked with countless country artists including Tim McGraw, Rascal Flatts, and Lady Annabellum, just to name a few. Glenn is one of the most kind, genuine people you'll ever meet and you're gonna love his stories. Let's get to it. Glenn Schweitzer, how are you, my friend? Doing well, doing well, AJ. Awesome, man, well, really appreciate your time. And I really only know a fraction of your story, so I'm excited to hear more about your career today. You have chased your passion for the arts and design, photography, video, all the above, and just created a wonderful catalog of work. And I'd love to hear uh, a little bit about uh, how that all came about. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks for caring. Before we dive into your career, I'd love to rewind the clock back to your childhood growing up in Southern California in the 60s and 70s. Can you tell me a little bit about what that was like? I was born in 62 in Southern California. My mom, bless her heart, I mean, she had to make ends meet for two kids, two boys. And so she ended up having to work full time. She got a job over at Disney. She started at Disney right out of college and worked in the music publishing department. She was even a model for some of the things. She was beautiful. She looked like Snow White. My mom started at Disney at a young age and then quit Disney because having kids. But then fast forward a little farther, my mom and dad got divorced after a horrible, horrible situation. But my mom went back to Disney after my mom and dad got divorced. And so I think I was about nine years old at that time. She started back in the same department, but then she was promoted and became an executive secretary and all that. But she knew Walt Disney's daughter and she was really good friends with Diane Disney. She knew Walt through that. And she knew Walt obviously because she saw him at the studio once in a while. It was a funny story. The first time that she had ever met Walt, she was only back at the studio for a short time and she recalled stepping into an elevator and the only other person in there was a guy named Walt Disney. And she was scared to death because she had not met him yet. So here she is now, just my mom and Walt Disney on this elevator. And she goes, hi, Mr. Disney. It's a beautiful day today, isn't it? Or, you know, something like that. And he ignored her. He didn't say, he didn't reply to her. And she was so heartbroken. She, I, she just recalled just like, you know, sinking into her shell. And well, what happened is that as soon as the elevator stopped, she got off, he got off the elevator and he turned around and said to my mom, he goes, my name is Walt. He <laughs> smiled and walked off. It was just so charming, you know, and it was like, but she became friends with him after that. And, You know, and growing up at Disney with my mom working there, I mean, I got to watch movies like uh, Apple Dumpling Gang or Pete's Dragon, these horrible movies back then, but I got to watch them being filmed because I would eat lunch and I would just walk the studio a lot when I was a little kid. And um, that was fun. It was just an amazing journey. So yeah, my mom worked at Disney for 30 years. So as you're walking around Disney, seeing all this creativity going on, is is that really what spurred your passion to, to get into that? You know what, I, that's actually a really good question. It inspired me to want to do film production. I basically quit college to go to Disney. I thought, you know what, if everything that I was aiming for was at the studio, why go to school? I think I was 19 when I started at Disney. I was started in the mailroom. Because of this job, I was able to go into everybody's office. It's a weird thing because I, I did not have a portfolio. I was not a creative artist. I just kind of thought, you know what? I'm just, I've got nothing to lose. I'm going to go into every vice president's office and just say, hey, got any openings? 
I remember doing this. I mean, I'm pushing my mail cart and I was just a dork, you know, and I remember going into this one guy's office and his name was Richard Freed. He was vice president of a new division called Disney Channel slash home entertainment. And so this is way before, and this is before computers, this is before everything. So the Disney Channel was just starting and I went to this guy and I said, hey, got any openings? You know, I'm, and I showed him my horrible portfolio because, and again, never took an art class, but I had art pieces in there. Well, this guy looked at me and said, yeah, I think we got something for you. So he hired me on the spot and I was hired in the home video department. So that was part of the Disney Channel, but I was working in the home VHS boxes in that world. And they hired me as a project coordinator. And so I was the in-between between Disney marketing department and all the ad agencies in Los Angeles. I thought, okay, this is cool. I'm, the, I'm working with all these ad agencies and I had this new passion. And I think I worked in the department about a year until I went to my boss and said, you know, I can probably save you some money. I love what these guys are doing. I'll, I'll learn design. So anyway, Disney offered, said, hey, we will reimburse you for your classes. If you take these classes and you get a B or better, we'll pay you back. So I did it. I took advantage of that. So I took night classes and for two years, I just kept taking art classes and design. And one day they hired me. So I became a designer in the home video department. I had to learn to use stat cameras, spec type, paste ups, mechanicals, you know, rubber cement, that whole thing. And so I was designing newsletters and doing all that. And so I worked there for about eight years. That was kind of my passion, you know, just learning art. And Disney was really the one that put me on that path to kind of learn more and go through um, the art school. And, and because of that, I was able to start the career mm -hmm. after that. So you grew up in California, cut your teeth at Disney in the home video department. Tell me what led to your move to Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah, so when, well, that's fast forward. So moving to Nashville in 92, I was immediately fell into healthcare. I was doing design for a healthcare company. And it was the most depressing thing I'd ever done because it was a hemophilia client. And everybody who worked there either had hemophilia or had a family member with it. So we were dealing with a lot of bad stuff. And I remember I was just hungry to do something different. Country music was exploding. This is Garth Brooks is huge. Reba McIntyre, I mean, everybody is just on fire. I didn't really follow country music at all. I didn't, I knew a few people. Groups that had a little more crossover, like Diamond Rio or Radney Foster, people that felt a little more, wasn't so twangy, I guess. And I remember meeting this guy named Brian Kagan, who was working with this new artist named Tim McGraw. You know, it is mullet. He was uh, young Tim. He had two albums out already. And he had a third album out, but it wasn't even on his, it's not even on his discography. It was so bad. His very first album doesn't exist. Nobody will ever find it. What I was told is that he was possibly going to lose his deal if he didn't get a number one or get anything. Well, it just happened at that time, he had a song called uh, Don't Take the Girl and uh, became a number one for him. And, that sort of started this whole momentum for him. And when I met him, I was only designing his t-shirts and just things for concerts. And I remember he was starting to work on a new album. And he said he wanted me to work on the new album. Problem is I had never designed an album at this point. <laughs> uh, you know, I was designing swag and I was designing a lot of things in the industry, but I'd never designed a CD package. He had to go to the record label, Curb Records, and say, hey, I want this guy to design my album. And I said, no, we have an art department. And who is this guy? Hey, Glenn Schweitzer is one of the most talented guys I've ever worked with. He's done so many great album covers for me and so many great photo sessions. I mean, he's he really is one of the coolest guys I've ever been around. And um, I know that my progression of my career wouldn't be where it's at without the art and the talent and the passion that he's put into it. So Tim fought for me and won. I got lucky because that album happened to be one called Everywhere. And it was the album that has a half face of Tim. 
that album was a number one album. And then I designed this concert tour book. And then I was designing a lot of other stuff for him. The label saw what I was doing. And they said, okay, we kind of like what he's doing, I guess. So they they fired their art department. They let them go. There are only two or three people in there, but still let them go. And for 13 years, I did every album that was on Curb Records. I designed, you know, from Sawyer Brown to Winona to a lot of the Christian artists, Michael English, Jonathan Pierce, Hal Ketchum, Lyle Lovett. I mean, I just, I could not have been luckier to be doing what I was doing at that time, all because of Tim McGraw. You mentioned uh, like the Half Face uh, album design. I, I forget, d did you have a hand in, in sort of suggesting that? Yeah, that was purely, that was a fight, in fact, because at that time, back then, CD covers really were publicity photos. You know, it was meant to be a very literal image. When I started doing work in the pop world, it's a whole different world because you could get away with abstract covers. You could do things that do not show the artist or the group. Think about old classic LPs, Boston, you know, with guitar flying. Country didn't really embrace that. Tim liked it, but the label said, the music world does not know this guy yet. So who do we think we are? Assuming that if we show half a face that they're gonna know who that is. And it's like, let's play the perception game. It really was about that. So Tim believed in it right away. The label, we always had to kind of push them on things. You know, that was a normal photograph. I actually cropped in tight, airbrushed it, darker on one side. So yeah, I was able to create that. And, and when I present album covers, I was presenting 30 to 40 covers. It's a lot. But I knew that if I presented more than I needed, we are also gonna have the next single cover out of this. So basically this presentation that I would do would have many other projects that would come out of it. So if I presented 30 covers, we would hopefully end up with a CD cover, some single covers, and then some poster ideas too. And then were you shooting that photography as well, or were you involved in the photo shoot? I wish, no, I, I went to the photo shoots, but only as the art director, but I didn't have a lot of say back then either. You know, in terms of having Tim's face or the, the hat brim pointing down, I would have input on some of that, but a lot of it came from the Photoshop work that I would have to do where I would take some shots that he is looking down and maybe part of an eye was showing and I would kind of zoom in on that and crop. I got into more of the art of retouching, creating color and making that what it is. And so I kind of became a, a retoucher here in Nashville. I became, I was doing a lot of retouching for artists and labels because they liked what I was doing, I guess, with some of that. So yeah, I wasn't doing photography. The photography came much later. Mm -hmm. And uh, so at what point was it that you started Fresh Design? So my company is called Fresh. So I became Fresh LLC, and under that is Fresh Design and Fresh Films. I've designed, I believe, close to 450 albums now. And I remember I had so many friends that were getting into music, and it was ridiculous. Who, who would assume that somebody would go out and spend $10,000 to $100,000 for music video for a new artist? There's a group, Lady Antebellum. Um, I knew Hillary Scott. They had just gotten together, Charles Kelly and Dave Haywood. I got to meet them and they, they weren't really a group yet. They were just rehearsing and writing music. And so I was invited to just come and I just started filming them, you know, in their session and they're trying to get a record deal. So I stepped in and tried to create content. So we did photo shoots, I designed their logo, shot a music video for them called Never Alone. And again, they did not have a record deal yet. But everything we did made them look like an established artist. And they got a record deal with Capitol Records after that. And, you know, that was kind of fun. So it was things like this that led to me doing photography and video because these were friends that couldn't afford anything. So I was charging next to nothing to do it. I'd probably shot about 150 music videos, but I was getting really kind of burned out on it. It was way too much pressure because I never started a production company. When I film a music video, it was just me. Maybe an assistant, but it was just me. I ran the camera, lights, audio, I did the editing. It was just important to me to do it all. I don't know, fast forward, I just got a little intimidated. Something happened where I didn't like dealing with the politics of the labels. You know, I just wanted to run off with the artist and do a fun video. 
Like Hal Ketchum is a great example. I love, he's one of my favorite artists I've ever worked with. Designed a bunch of his albums where he wanted me to shoot his music video, and it was called In Front of the Alamo. So Hal Ketchum and myself, we flew to Dripping Springs, Texas, and uh, he knew somebody who owned the movie set for the Alamo. And uh, it was going to be torn down in the coming years. And we filmed it there, just, just howling myself. It was very empowering, you know, to, to just have a camera and I'm with the artist. And that's why I never wanted to grow the business, you know, and do production people. I didn't, I wanted the artist to feel like I'm 100% theirs. For me, story became so important because that defines these people. That, def you know, it's how hard people work to get to a certain point, or if it's the making of a song, the writing of a song, the making of a music video. So I wasn't a songwriter, but it's like, hey, I could at least tell the story of how these videos are made, and in turn, interview the writer of the song, interview the artist, interview the director who's doing it, and find out where did this concept come from? You know, what, is, what does this mean? Well, whatever we were doing worked because we started making it on People Magazine's website, people.com. And that was pretty empowering. You know, I was like, this is kind of cool. And because of these behind the scenes music videos, it, it made me fall in love with documentaries. And I remember doing my first documentary that was not in the music industry at all. It was about wild Mustangs. And that changed everything. They didn't understand that they were going to have to become teachers. And I think they've become so much more respectful of, of what it takes to be a teacher. They've become better students. So at this point, you've had this long career working mainly in music and entertainment. Catch me up on what your career looks like today. I'm in an interesting place. As I've gotten older, when I hit 60, designing a logo for a 17-year-old girl who's an art new artist on a label seemed weird. And I preface that by saying myself at 17 would I have had my grandpa design something cool for me? No, I don't think so. So right now, my world has changed. Still working in the music industry a little bit. Still work with two labels. I don't do a lot. I actually work on the road a lot because I don't, I don't want to do photo shoots and videos for the labels anymore. You know, moving from California to Tennessee, I didn't miss a lot of things. But as time went on, I really wanted a snow ski. Started looking, well, where are the closest places to ski around here? And it was in North Carolina. So kept going out there and bought a little log cabin on a mountain called Beach Mountain. The cool thing about Beach Mountain is going there, there is a path called the Appalachian Trail. There's a hiking trail that goes from Georgia to Maine in over 2,000 miles. I just would always see these hikers. The trail crossed this Highway 19E. I was so fascinated by these people. I was like, what are they doing? I was so fascinated by story that I wanted to meet a hiker and just ask him why they're doing this. I hiked three miles up this Appalachian Trail, finally met a couple, and I did a quick interview with them. And I was so blown away that I'm realizing this is cool. And people are out here to change their lives. You know, you ask what I'm doing now, I think that key moment of me hiking the Appalachian Trail interviewing this person changed my life. I'm getting some amazing interviews out there. I need to do a documentary. It's really about finding peace. It's about getting outside and finding God. That's where I connect mostly with God. I think everybody needs to have some adventures and some excitement in their life, you know, something they can reflect back on. This is from Tarjay. Yeah, 14 bucks, man. I get really hot on the trail, so. The airier it is, the better it is for me. It's just you against nature, and the question is, can you survive this? There's a lot of stories about the Appalachian Trail and the whole documentary called Trail Mix that just started changing my life. I started doing these things called life stories. I'm calling it the never-ending documentary. Just as you go into Ancestry.com, you know, you go up and say, oh God, who's my great-grandfather? 
find your great grandfather. You're gonna read about him maybe, you might see that he had a brother. With technology these days, wouldn't it be cool if we, if I look up my great grandfather and I see a video of him and I hear his voice talking about his brothers or his sisters or where he grew up and I thought that's what I need to do is start interviewing these people for future generations. The way I've got it set up, you know, we're finding out about their best friends and, you know, what were your favorite foods and what were your movies that you went to back then. And, and so that's kind of where I'm, what I'm doing now. My dad was a carpenter. He was a builder. I went to work for him. I really enjoyed it, uh, most of it, but he didn't pay me very much. <laughs> well, Glenn, you have been more than generous with your time today. Just in closing, what advice would you give to the next generation of storytellers? Uh, that's a really good question. I should have thought of this one. What I've learned is that we are all the same. We all have a story. So I would say, never be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to go up to somebody and just smile. Ask questions about their life, you know? And to fast forward that, the reason I say that is ask your parents questions. Anybody can do this life story thing. You know, somebody had mentioned to me early on, well, why would I hire you to do this? I can do this on my phone. And my question is, well, have you? Well, no, but I can. It's like, just do it. You know, I'm not even, I don't care what it's with, just document your conversation. But just know that if you want it to be good enough quality, you know, for future generations, and maybe you can add to it, don't just be shooting it vertical on your phone. You know, shoot it with a normal camera and good audio because that truly is important to tell the story. So that's my, just don't be afraid to go up to people. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to involve yourself in their story. You know, help them out if you can. You know, and just, let's just be better people. Be kind, be gentle. That's, that's what it's about. I love that, man. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Glenn. Really appreciate it. I uh, love hearing your stories and always great talking with you. You're welcome. Thank you, AJ. Hey, guys, I hope you enjoyed hearing Glenn's stories. I know I had a great time catching up with him. Hey, if you enjoy behind the scenes stories like this, please consider subscribing to the channel, liking this video, and I'll see you in the next one.